Good evening and welcome to Kennedy Space Center in Florida where we have three astronauts and one cosmonaut about to suit up for their journey to the International Space Station in just about four hours. You are seeing aerial views of what their ride will be today. A brand new Falcon 9 rocket atop. We have the Dragon Endeavor. Crew 8 is a continuation of regular crewed flights from U.S. soil to the International Space Station as part of NASA's commercial crew program. The crew's ride to space, again, what you're seeing there on your screen. And with me to help commentate to what's happening tonight is NASA astronaut Rajachari. And now here we are inside the suit up room where we see our three astronauts and one cosmonaut standing, getting ready to get seated in the same configuration of seats that they'll sit in in Dragon, right? Exactly, yeah. So you'll see uh, uh, Matt and Mike are on the top half of the screen and then Jeanette and Alexander on the, the bottom half. Um, we're getting to see a little bit more than we did yesterday. So yeah. you saw Alexander kind of fist punching, so he's working his fingers into the gloves. Um, and then you can see Matt's, uh, there's two zippers there, an orange and a white zipper. Mm -hmm. So the orange zipper is the pressure garment, and that's why he's got just two people, just verified that visually that it's closed. He'll tuck that in with the, uh, the Velcro, and then the white zipper is the outer garment zipper. Um, and so the, but you saw Matt, and then both of the SpaceX techs all visually verified that orange zipper. Um, when you pull it closed, there's a white tooth, and that's how you know it's completely sealed. And so that's what they're visually looking at. And then uh, Maddie, who's the SpaceX tech there with the uh, iPad, is kind of running the show here in the suit-up room. Now, as we see Alexander and Jeanette taking a seat, question, how long does it take to put on the suit? Um, so we actually train uh, for one of, the, one of the emergency areas we train for is what's called a, a mask to suit transition. So the crews are able to do that pretty quickly uh, on the order of single digit number of minutes. Um, mm. Because in the capsule, there's times when you'll, a lot of the time you'll have to suit off, mm. um, but you will have to potentially put it on for some, if there's... This is you know, LDM Countdown 1 with the T-minus four hour situational awareness briefing. We are currently counting down to a teaser of 0353 UTC, 225338 local, with an instantaneous window. The crew has started suit donning and lead checks in preparation to begin ingress activities, and the advanced team is currently on the way to the pad. Vehicle gases are at me up, FTS checkouts are complete, and Dragon prop tanks are pressed. Weather all overall looks much better than yesterday, with launch weather at a 25% probability of violation for flight through precip and anvil clouds. Current trends over the last hour appear to be more favorable. Ascent risk winds are much better than yesterday, but we'll continue to monitor precipitation in the staging area up until L minus one hour. We kind of scrub. The next available launch attempt will be tomorrow, March 4th. Procedure 52911 is open in the event of a crew contingency from ingress through launch. As a reminder, the launch escape system will be armed prior to propellant load today. Hangar X is going to lock down at T minus 45 minutes and will last until a spacecraft separation or after the launch escape system is disarmed. All personnel requested to stay in their locations until lockdown is complete. And C, the other report on Falcon 9 Health. Falcon 9 is healthy and tracking no issues at this time, ready to proceed. And Eddie. Dragon team is looking good over here. Dragon is healthy and ready to proceed. All right, copy all. And this will conclude the T minus four hour brief, unless there's any further questions. All right, that was just the T minus four hour situational awareness brief, confirming again that we are go for launch uh, at 10.53 and 38 seconds Eastern time. Weather, again, much better. You heard them just reporting that out. 75% go, much more favorable than yesterday, as well as the ascent uh, corridor weather, much better, uh, but they will be watching uh, precipitation uh, and other conditions there until the T minus one hour mark. And why don't we take some time now to introduce you to Matt Dominic, our commander. He was born and raised in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Married to Faith Dominic, and they have two daughters. Matt earned a Master of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School and was designa designated a Naval Aviator in 2007. He made two deployments to the North Arabian Sea, flying close air support missions in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. He has more than 1,600 hours of flight time in 28 different aircraft, 
400 carrier arrested landings and 61 combat missions. This is going to be his first space flight. Yeah, and and uh, like we talked about yesterday, uh, Megan, the other important thing about Matt is he's a turtle. So as a fellow turtle uh, <laughs> of the class of 2017, uh, great to see another one going to space. He'll join Jaws and Laurel who are up there now. Um, so there'll be uh, three of them on board. But um, great to see Matt flying. He is, uh, he is always uh, one of the most hilarious people in any room you're in, <laughs> but also one of the most technically competent um, and just knows how to get the job done. So I'm excited to see him commanding this mission and heading up to join uh, the rest of the crew up on the ISS. And as his uh, pressure check was completed, we have pilot Michael Barrett sitting next to him. He was selected by NASA in 2000. He's the only one of Crew 8 who's been to space before. He was part of uh, Expedition 1920 in 2009 and STS-133 in 2011. In total, he spent 212 days in space. He is board certified in internal and aerospace medicine. He has actually been awarded numerous times for his contributions to space medicine research. Michael lives in League City, Texas with his wife, Michelle, and they have five children. Yeah, and Mike and Michelle are great. And uh, you mentioned he's the, the one on the crew with previous space flight experience and, and couldn't have a better mentor for the rest of the crew. Um, and I know that because he was my mentor during ASCAN training. So he, if you Google him, uh, he is the person that writes the book uh, on flight medicine, space flight medicine. So if you are a space flight medicine student, uh, you surely know his work because that's the book you're studying from. All right, and now this is mission specialist Jeanette Epps we're taking a look at. This will also be her first space flight. The Syracuse, New York native was a NASA fellow during graduate school and then worked for Ford Motor Company where she received a U.S. patent for her research into auto collisions and countermeasure systems. After leaving Ford, she joined the Central Intelligence Agency for seven years and she worked as a technical intelligence officer before becoming an astronaut in 2006. She has a Master of Science and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Aerospace Engineering. And Raja, she's also a twin. She is indeed, yeah. So I'm pretty sure it's her, though, in the suit-up room. I, think, I don't think they would have been <laughs> looking at it this far. Um, uh, since she's been at NASA, she's actually got some pretty unique experiences in the sense that uh, she's obviously flying on a Dragon tonight, but she actually worked a lot with the Starliner. So she's one mm -hmm. of the few people in the office who's seen uh, both of our new vehicles that are, that are U.S. built uh, headed to the space station, so both the Boeing and the Dragon, uh, which is a pretty cool experience. Yeah, really accomplished, uh, our whole team actually, and let's introduce you to our last Crew 8 member here. So this is Alexandra Grabenkin, mission specialist, also a first-time flyer, graduated from the Irkutska Military Aerospace Engineering Institute in 2002, majoring in the engineering, maintenance, and repair of aircraft radio navigation systems. He then attended the Moscow Technical University of Communications and Informatics, graduating with a degree in radio communications, broadcasting, and television. He was accepted into the Cosmonaut Corps in 2018 and will serve as flight engineer while on board the space station. We're getting a close-up view of him right there. Visor's up, so I believe his pressure check was also completed. Yep, yeah, so Alexander uh, is in the, one of the newer groups of the cosmonaut classes, and this is a testament to the continuing partnership. Uh, Laurel's up on the space station now. She got up there via Soyuz. Uh, Alexander will be heading up uh, via Dragon, so continuing to, to learn from him and work with one another. This is a shot, actually, of the astronaut support person, right? So yep. wearing number 21, the one is covered there, but number 21, that is Denise Burnham, and she is a NASA astronaut candidate, graduating, actually, in two days. And what's her role here? Yeah, so Denise is what we call the ASP, which is the astronaut support person. Um, in the shuttle era, they used to call it the Cape Crusaders, but essentially it's the person that... Uh, is the eyes and ears of the crew as they're setting up in the final stages for the launch. So she's been in quarantine with them. Um, and in the shuttle era, it would involve being the person, the only other person besides the crew that would go inside and configure switches. What Denise will do, as what has been doing this whole time in quarantine, um, as the schedule shift and as there's different meetings and launch, like the weather briefs, all those mm -hmm. kind of things. Uh, if the crew is unable to make those things as their schedule shifting, she is covering all that. The other You'll see the very public thing she'll do later on is call uh, from the, the phone on the pad. Uh, but the thing you won't see uh, when they cut the feed here is all the little things, so like getting glasses ready, uh, if like someone has a timer, if they like where exactly on their leg they want the iPad positioned. Hmm. So all those things seem very little, but 
um, after so many sims, you kind of have a scan, or we call it a, a cockpit cross-check, and it's very kind of particular of where you want all those different things, where you want maybe, like I said, like a timer located, as you can see, where you want your watch. Um, and so she's kind of like the expert and knows for each person exactly how they want it configured to include, you know, Jeanette maybe wants her volume set at whatever on this loop and, and having all that preset. So when they get into the Dragon, things are ready to go. And I do want to point out that everybody else who's in a black suit, SpaceX employees. Correct. Yep. The only the ninjas, person. Yep. yep. The only person um, who's a NASA employee in a black suit is Denise. Correct. Yep. All right. Here they come. All right. Here they come in front. Matt and Mike, commander and pilot, and now we have the mission specialists, Alexander and Jeanette. Applause from folks around them as they walk down the hallway here in crew quarters and are getting inside an elevator, their first few steps before their big trip. And this space. is kind of a cool surprise. Uh, I don't know if they got this far yesterday since we didn't to cut the feed, but I at least didn't know that there would be that banner in there when we got in the elevator yeah, with all the signatures, so it's a really cool thing. Was, um, as soon as the door's closed and the camera's on, you can turn around and see all the signatures of all the folks that you worked with on that banner, which is kind of a, a really touching time. Here they come. Crew 8 taking their first steps outside before their journey to the International Space Station. We hear some cheers, cheers yep. them waving from left to right. Let me introduce you. We have mission specialist Alexander Grubenkin. Then we have pilot Michael Barrett, commander Matt Dominic, and mission specialist Jeanette Epps. They're walking now to uh, greet family and friends who came specifically for them. They have assigned spots with assigned stanchions of people. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So what you'll see is that they won't go any further down towards where the administrator is standing, so that's as close as they'll get to them since they haven't been in quarantine. And then their families, the immediate families, are staying behind the stanchions there. And then once they get in the vehicles, <laughs> the, uh, the families have been quarantined when we come up to the windows. Yeah, we are expecting them to leave the ONC here at around T minus three hours and 15 minutes. Another great cheer from the crowd. As we see Jeanette Epps taking her seat in her Tesla, she'll be joined by Alexander Grubenkin. And then in front of them, we have Matt and Mike, who just got seated as well. And then the, the people in the Teslas with them are the, the SpaceX ninjas, and usually there'll be a suit tech, and then either a flight dock or two suit techs, just kind of the mix kind of depends. But um, so you're kind of always always ready to respond if anything is uh, having problems with the suits. And now we can see the crew is departing from the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, beginning their 20-minute drive with a full security escort across NASA's Kennedy Space Center to launch pad 39A. In the words of their license plates, yay space. <laughs> Here they are coming to take a look at the rocket. That's the, right. There's Matt and Mike walking over to get a good look at their ride to space. And like we mentioned, it's, it's hard to see because the helmet's heavy and not really melted till backwards, but so you got to kind of lean back. To uh, yeah. <laughs> and you can see he's, he's bracing his chin, trying to tilt the, the helmet up. Taking a nice long look. And as you mentioned, the, the capsule is being used for the fifth time, but a brand new booster. Um, and SpaceX has yeah, pioneered the, the reuse of both the booster and the capsule, so pretty amazing. What the. Yep, fifth time Dragon, first time Falcon 9 today. And now here they are, they're getting into an elevator that will take them up the launch tower. We won't be joining them inside the elevator, but we do have a picture of the buttons inside there. If we can pull that up as they walk inside, <laughs> as you can see, the bottom floor is Earth. And it's where good. they'll be going to is space. It makes it very easy to know which button you have to push. <laughs> yeah, no confusion there, huh? And there we have Commander Matt Dominic, Michael, uh, Pilot Michael Barrett, walking down the crew access arm towards their Dragon Endeavor. Walked into the camera. <laughs> Here they are now into that white room, like we were saying. So it looks like they are removing their gloves now. Yep, it looks like they might be signing the uh, around the meatball here. 
So this is another tradition. Yep. We have the NASA meatball here. And starting with demo two with Bob uh, Hurley and, and um, uh, Bob Benkin. Bob Benkin. Yeah, whoop, I was like, whoop, wait. <laughs> you say their names often all the time together. And then, <laughs> but so they sign uh, their names around this meatball. Yep. And then, yeah, it started uh, as many traditions start. Um, once one crew has done it, then you keep doing it. They're running out of space there, too. <laughs> Jeanette and Alexander. Yep, Jeanette and Alexander, Jeanette Epps, Alexandra Grabenkin are two mission specialists for Crew 8, walking across the crew access arm, about to join <laughs> their crewmates in Dragon. You saw some waves, thumbs up. They're chatting as they make their way across the crew access arm. They'll uh, do the signing of the meatball here while the other two are getting strapped in. Yeah, the other two are already both in. So we have uh, Matt and Mike already inside Dragon. Going into Dragon, that's called ingressing. They just ingressed into Dragon. Mm -hmm. This crew is moving. It's better to be ahead than behind, that's exactly. for sure. Exactly. So that's Alexander signing right there. And now Jeanette. And you can see, like you alluded to earlier, like why they don't all four try to get in at the same time. Uh, in microgravity, um, it's easy to do because you've got the, the vertical and three-dimensional space you can use when you're not constrained by 1G. But mm -hmm. here on the ground, trying to have four people and the suit techs and the hatch techs, all those people all in the same spot, it gets pretty crowded. Yeah, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, there's eight people either in the capsule, at least eight people either in the capsule or in the white room right now. So as we can see, uh, Matt and Mike have their harness on. It's a five point harness. Yep, yeah, so there's a, there's a harness and then also where their boots are at, there's uh, a connection in the sole of their boot that locks their feet into the, the footrests uh, and then yeah, you're seeing that they're they're helping. You can see a good view of Alexander's thing. It's a, a like a rotary knob that those five straps go into. Hmm. And it looks like on um, Mike's right leg, that's where the umbilical will be connected to, right? Right. They're all connected right now. You can see it on Jeanette. Yeah, all of, on all their right legs. You hmm. can see it's um, connected. So at some point, I would assume they'll start doing comm checks. Um, they can probably hear each other at this point. We might guess depending on whether the, the ground's configured it yet. Yeah, comm checks are They'll expected. usually probably wait for the, the, the text to get out of there, if it says otherwise you hear a bunch of background noise. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, so explain what the umbilical system does. Like, what do they get through these umbilicals that they're now attached to? Yeah, so the umbilical gives them air, uh, both for cooling and the breathing air, and then also it's the comm link. So it's, that's the, the, the two big things. It's, um, so environmental control and then communication. So as was reported out, they're in their seats, strapped in. We expect comm checks soon, followed by seat rotation, and then suit leak checks. They're ready. Thumbs up for all those things coming up from all four crew members. All right, so it looks like they're closing the hatch now, so they must be happy with what they've gotten for uh, pictures and documentation. And like you said, the next big thing here is still about uh, nine-ish minutes away from the plan time to start the leak checks. Again, a beautiful shot of the launch pad. We're flying a new Falcon 9 booster, Dragon Endeavor flying on its fifth flight. That's the most for any Dragon spacecraft. Right, Raja? Yeah, it's uh, the fleet leader. Um, in the original, uh, the original certification done by the commercial crew program, which just the fact that we were reusing capsules to begin with was, you know, new boundary breaking and, and not an unprecedented. So this is the fact the program and SpaceX pulled that off together um, in and of itself is amazing. And now here they're at five. Uh, and so after this, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of analysis um, uh, taking a really close look at uh, how the vehicles actually performed over the five flights um, and, and what the forward steps are. But uh, it's pretty amazing to, to even 
yeah, like, like early mentioned the broadcast like five years ago, just the idea of saying like, oh, it's on its fifth flight. Like, we wouldn't even that wouldn't have been in the vernacular, and now it's just talking about it as if it's oh yeah, of course it's the fifth flight. What else would it be? So it's um, the 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 impossible has become the common. Right, and the plan for uh, the commercial crew program is after Endeavour flies on its fifth flight, they'll evaluate it uh, and work with SpaceX to maybe determine whether or not it could be recertified to fly additional flights. Exactly, yeah, or, and I think there'll be, like I said, a lot of analysis that you may not have to refurbish the whole capsule, maybe there's certain key components or parts uh, or critical pieces, um, but yeah, we'll really dig in um, with the help of the folks at Johnson, KSC, and Marshall, and really all the NASA centers that, that help the commercial crew program um, to figure out uh, how we can continue using it. T minus 27 minutes and 10 seconds and counting to launch. Let's head back to Jasmine Hopkins, who's now with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy. Thank you so much, Megan. As always, it's an honor to have our NASA leadership here for a launch. And of course, we know there's a couple watch items right now with Crew 8, but both of our leaders right here have been to space before. So actually, can you guys talk about why safety is so paramount in human space flight? Well, you're dealing with a very unforgiving environment with uh, a lot of explosive power and uh, you're defying the laws of gravity. And as a result, everything has to be right. So you don't launch until it's right. Now, Pam is an astronaut space shuttle commander. She's flown three times in space. I've flown once. And uh, you've been through this many times. Uh, you didn't have as many scrubs as we had on ours. We got in, strapped in, ready to go, and scrubbed four times over the better part of a month. But that pretty well tells you you don't launch until it's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, Bill. I had several scrubs of my own, uh, delayed six days for my first flight, uh, three days for my second, had a couple of strap-ins. You're right, not as many as you. But I think, um, you know, it's important to remember that the crew is very focused on their mission on the space station, and it's not like they're saying, hey, I've got to get home for something. They're going to wait until they're safe, and that's Stage the way two, we do it, too. As Bill said, a lot of things have to go right. Uh, and we're going to keep safety number one. Right, right. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And of course, we're on our eighth rotational flight with SpaceX. You know, it feels like just yesterday, Demo 2 launched. So can uh, Bill Nelson, can you speak to the, the progress of the commercial crew program? Well, it's unbelievable. Uh, just think uh, how much the cost of launching has come down as a fact of reusing the rockets. Uh, and just uh, the Falcon 9 has been such a proven workhorse. Uh, this past year, uh, they launched Falcon 9s, if you can believe it, 96 times. This year, they're going to launch 146 times. And next year, 200 times. Wow, it's a workhorse. Oh, yeah, it definitely is. And you know, we've, we've had a lot of success with SpaceX already this year with the launch of PACE to help study our climate. Uh, we also had the a su a successful landing on the moon for the first time in over 50 years. So, Pam, can you speak to what's next for SpaceX and NASA together? Well, Jasmine, it's amazing what's coming up. First of all, the crew is going to have a very exciting increment. They ho have over 200 science experiments that they'll be running, including several medical experiments that will benefit all humanity. But while they're there, they're going to have some very exciting visitors. We're really looking forward to seeing Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore launch on the Boeing Starliner on the first crewed flight test of that brand new human spaceflight vehicle. They'll be visiting the station. And then uh, if we stay on schedule, this increment will also see a new cargo vehicle going up with Sierra Space's Dream Chaser. Uh, and then you look at the rest of what we're doing in science. We have uh, an eclipse coming up. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be the last eclipse visible in North America for uh, almost two decades. And uh, then we'll be launching NISAR, which is our partnership with India, uh, to look at the Earth. And uh, we 
also have uh, the X-59, our new X-plane, right. uh, quiet <laughs> supersonic boom yeah, uh, coming up. And year. then, of course, the Artemis II crew, you're going to be seeing a lot of them down here in yeah. Florida as they're training for their mission next year. Right. This is a pretty That's thrilling year. we got a lot going it on. It really is. There's so much going on. But, of yeah. course, we, we still want to keep our eyes right now on Crew 8. So thank you so much, Bill and Pam, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. So when Crew 8 arrives at the International Space Station, they will be greeted by seven other crew members, including NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara. She's been on board since last September and delivered this personal message to her soon-to-be new crewmates. Hey, Crew 8. I'm so stoked for your launch and to welcome you on board the International Space Station. I very vividly remember my first few days on Space Station, so I'm looking forward to getting to relive those days through your eyes, and uh, I'll try not to laugh too much. Matt, uh, it's been an amazing seven years so far. Uh, it's going to be really special to get to fly with you, uh, such a good friend, and I know this is going to be one of our craziest adventures together yet. Mike, I uh, can't wait to share this boat with you. Jeanette, looking forward to continuing the good times that we had in Star City together. Sasha, there's no ice rink on board, but uh, we have some other games planned up here. I hope you guys have a beautiful launch. I hope you enjoy the special time that you're going to get to have in Dragon together orbiting Earth. And uh, we'll be on board waiting with a big meal prepared with all the foods that we don't like. So with that, safe travels, and I'll see you on the other side of the hatch on Space Station. Dragon is in configured for terminal count. Falcon 9 tanks pressurizing for strong back retract. And we did just hear that call out. Dragon is in terminal count. The onboard computers now are taking control of the spacecraft. The first stage will finish liquid oxygen, loading in about three minutes, followed by completion of second stage locks loading one minute later. Strong back retract has started. There's a call out over the nets that we are moving forward into strong back retract. The next thing you might be able to see on your screen is actually gonna be the clamp arms opening up around the base of this second stage. That will allow the strong back to recline about two degrees away from the vehicle. And because we've now begun pressurizing Falcon 9, we know that it's strong enough to stand on its own. That TE will throw back all the way to 45 degrees at liftoff. The strong back is part of the transporter erector, which provides liquids, gases, and electrical connections to the vehicle. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. Five seconds. Dragon copy, go for launch. Let's go, crew reports go. Now about 30 seconds away from liftoff. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition, engine full power, and liftoff of NASA Crew 8. Go Falcon, go SpaceX, and go NASA. One alpha. Endeavor ascends a beacon of human ambition. 1.7 million pounds of thrust now propelling Falcon 9 and Crew 8. Vehicle is pitching down range. Up. One, bravo. So with that call out, 
Copy one Bravo. We know that Falcon 9 is throttling back up and that one call out for one Bravo means that we are in the second and final abort mode for the first stage, continuing to get good performance from Falcon 9. Now at this point, the crew started. are already pulling over two Gs. And with that call out, we know that that engine chill for MVAC, which is our second stage engine, has now also begun. That also means we have a couple of events that are going to happen in rapid succession. First is that chill on the MVAC engine, and then we'll have main engine cutoff, or MECO, where the nine engines on the first stage of Falcon 9 will cut off ahead of first and second stage separation. Then the Merlin vacuum engine on board the second stage will ignite and carry the crew eight astronauts to orbit while the first stage begins its journey back to Earth. At this point in the flight, the nine Merlin stage engines are starting down. to throttle down and we're standing, there's that call out for, st for throttle down and we're standing by, by for Miko. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. And back in the engine. Two Alpha. Copy two Alpha. So those incredible views on your screen and of course the cheering behind me means that we have had successful main engine cutoff, stage separation, and ignition of our MVAC engine on board stage two. We are also in two alpha for the aborts if needed. Of course, that second stage is being illuminated on the right hand side of your screen by our single Merlin vacuum engine on board stage two. Now the next milestone we're tracking is the stage one boost back burn on the left hand side of your screen. And we are expecting completion of that burn in just about 10 seconds. Shannon. Copy Shannon. And that call out for Shannon, indicative of Shannon, Ireland, the very last abort zone in the second stage. The Merlin engine is about to shut down. You just saw it there on your screen. Dragon SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. Dragon Hearing copy. good call outs following second stage cutoff. The crew is Watch in a nominal or arm. as expected orbit. That is. And we are getting our first view of crew eight inside Endeavor. Three of them in space for the very first time. The first stage has already returned to Earth and landed successfully. And the second stage has shut down and we're awaiting separation. And you see it on your screen right there. Dragon, Dragon and SpaceX. Endeavor now flying free. Dragon, SpaceX, this is your launch chief engineer. Welcome to orbit. Uh, it truly is our greatest honor for you to trust us to launch you into space. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, and we trust that all the science and work you're about to do will continue to move humanity further towards the stars. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the ride, and thank you for flying on Falcon 9. Please send our regards to Crew 7, and make sure to remind them you just wanted to be fashionably late. I'll hand it off to the launch director for a few words. Dragon LD, I hope the ride was as awesome as a Cybertruck. Have a safe journey to the space station, and we look forward to see, seeing you when you get home. Thank you for flying SpaceX. SpaceX, oh my goodness, what an incredible ride to orbit. I'm both glad and not glad that you ha don't have a copy of our ICS. The cheers the whole way up are incredible. A big thank you to SpaceX for incredible instructors. Tyler, I'm talking to you and your team right now. Incredible instructors, engineers, and operators. They're the reason we are now safely in orbit. A thank you to NASA, Roscosmos, CSA, ESA, JAXA, who work together to make the International Space Station work for us all. And, of course, big thank you to my family, friends, and mentors who are the reason we're here today. Over to you, Mike. Yeah, hey, Earth, uh, just to let you know, it's kind of like a roller coaster ride with a bunch of really excited teenagers. Just want to mention the, uh, the NASA community is just a, a really warm but steely-eyed family that does amazing things, and it, it kind of hugs you, but it pushes you into the unknown while watching your back. 
It's really been an incredible place for me to grow over these past 30-plus uh, years. And now I'm really honored to fly this new generation spaceship with this new generation crew. Thanks to my own family for tolerating my otherworldly habits. Uh, thanks to NASA for being the backbone of exploration that, uh, that we are. And just thanks so much to our friends and colleagues at SpaceX for the awesome ride. It's great to be back in space again. And uh, I would like to second Mike and Matt's words. I'm super excited to be here. And, um, you know, I need a here. And the words that come to my mind is that I'm so grateful and I'm thankful for everyone who uh, got us to this point. There's no way we would have been able to do this without all the people, from all the instructors, from all the people supporting on the ground, to the, people, the folks in the kitchen who kept us fed and moved out in SpaceX. Yeah, I just I'm so grateful for everyone, and I just want to give a big thanks to my um, family and friends who came from all over the world to see this. Thank you for supporting me through all the all the days of um, waiting to get to this point. Thank you for everything, and I want to give a shout out, a quick shout out to my sisters who couldn't make it, Brenda and Patty, and then I also want to give a nod to Syracuse who supported me through everything and. I am in a New York state of mind right now. It is amazing. Thank you for everything. Warm greetings to everyone from the orbit. I would like to ex express the huge uh, gratitude to Roscosmos, NASA, ESA, JAXA teams, and all who took part in preparation and implementation. A separate shout out to my family and friends. Thank you for your support. My son, Seriosa, Vlad, Sasha, be good. Kuzbasa, Mitski, see you soon. Всех тепло приветствую с орбиты. Выражаю огромную благодарность коллективу Роскосмоса, НАСА и САДЖАКСА и всем без исключения причастным к подготовке и реализации нашего полета. Отдельный привет передаю своей семье и близким. Спасибо вам за поддержку. Сыновьям Сережа, Влад, Саша, будьте молодцами. Кузбас, мужки, до встречи. Dragon, we copied all, and we see the vehicle chasing down the International Space Station on orbit. Uh, nose cone opening is in progress. We saw nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. With that, you're go to raise visors. And uh, I've got one final note. We have a tradition on board this spacecraft for its travelers to bring a small token, a zero G indicator, if you will, to clearly demonstrate the, fle the free floating nature of objects traveling in orbit around the Earth. And I wonder if you've brought anything fitting that description. Well, you should ask. <laughs> oh, man. So, per tradition, we, of course, have a zero-G indicator. It's already been deployed. The significance of our zero-G indicator is not, not actually what it is, but who chose it. Many parents around the world have jobs that take them away from their children and families for long periods of time to serve their communities, their country, and the world. Military families are a prime example, but many jobs including our own, share this trait. The choice of the zero-G indicator was given to my daughters to represent the sacrifice that children everywhere make while their parents are serving away from home. We chose a stuffed family dog, and she is free-floating here today. Getting great views of Crew 8 on board their capsule there, and there is their zero-G indicator. Loved hearing the crew's description of who chose this, uh, who chose this animal and why, and everything that it means to them to their mission, and obviously the community standing behind each of these four astronauts. Mm -hmm.